Hello, Internet. I am back to do a video, um, hopefully a one-off. It might get split up into like a two-off. Is that what you call that? Um, nothing to do with the with the pirate game. Um, sorry if, if, if that's what you were hoping for. Um, this is something totally different. This is something that I kind of got uh, re-obsessed with uh, a few days ago, about a week ago. Um, so let me let me let me jump right into what we're we're going to be doing. Then I'll ramble more. So. Getting started with Antler. This is, this is a uh, article I found online when I was looking around. I was trying to learn how to do this thing, which I'll talk about. Uh, and this was the blog post that I eventually found. I, I had to like, I looked at it. It wasn't good enough. I went away, found some other things that came back and was like, no, this is good enough. Um, so Antler. Antler is this thing that uh, you use to define a programming language and the, the grammar and the structure of that language. Uh, this um, blog post has an example where Here's, here's their grammar. Uh, you start with a chat. It has a couple lines. Each line has a name. Uh, this says uh, token. I don't think this is properly called a token. Um, something else, spoilers, I don't know Antler, Antler 4 specifically. I, I just kind of brute forced my way through. I looked through examples, kind of saw what people were doing, stumbled through it, and figured things out. There is a grammar around right this that I just don't know. And so I'm going to say, if you know it, you're going to be offended when you listen to me. So I'm just warning you. <laughs> you're going to be like, why doesn't he know? How can he use these things and not know? I don't know. I just brute force my way through it. Um, so yeah, this lets you make a programming language. So you start by kind of defining a language. And then you're going to write the C sharp code that visits things. Um, there's some boilerplate for kind of loading up the, the whole thing. And then this article goes into talk about unit testing, which I didn't bother with. Um, which, <laughs> again, previous video, I was like, man, people should really be unit testing more. Um, but anyway, so I'm, I'm uh, breaking my own rules. Uh, this article is really cool, but it doesn't show like the full capabilities. Like, I really wanted to make a programming language with for loops and, and uh, if statements, right? Function calls. And, and this doesn't really show you how to do that. And so, again, I looked at some other articles. Um, I came back here, I, I brute forced my way through it, as I've already said like 50 million times, uh, and, and got it to work. Um, I do want to talk briefly, which is why I've got this little other tab up here, on why you would want to make a little scripting programming language. Um, and also, one quick little thing, with Antler, you could make an actual compiler that takes um, you know, your text programming language, pretend you're, you know, let's say you were inventing C, right? And you could take all your void mains or int mains or whatever, and var, star, char, whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you could take all that and, and actually compile it into assembly. You could do that with Antler. The other thing you can do with Antler, and what, we're gonna, and what I'm going to do in this video, is uh, make it an interpreter, so it'll be an interpreted language. So why would you want to do this? Here's a mess of a screen. Um, in Poppy Seed Pets, this is uh, a web game I run. This is my local database that I use for development. I have these essentially cards. They're used for tiles in a board game, but they're, they're kind of phrased as, as cards in other ways as well. But, but anyway, um, they have effects on them, right? And not having a programming language uh, to, to describe these things well, um, you know, I could have wrote something that tries to parse out text, uh, you know, of something that looks kind of like a programming language. Oh, I don't know, these scrollings within scrollings. Um, but I was like, no, that's not going to be, first of all, it's going to be way too hard. Um, it's not going to be good enough. I'm going to do JSON. And so, you know, I say, what is the, the type of event here? It's a challenge. Here's what happens if you fail. And then it goes into do another thing. And, and basically every um, curly brace is another block that could have, like I could have another type pet challenge or whatever in here. Um, so it's nested. It's, it's basically, a, I don't know, a choose your own adventure kind of thing. Sometimes the player is making choices. Uh, like here, it will send some button text over to the front end, and then you get to choose. In this case, there is only one button. Uh, but other cases, uh, in other instances, it's done by the, the game logic. You know, there's like role-playing elements in this thing, so it does some dice rolls. Um, here you're getting some experience, blah, 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 blah. Okay, you could do this, right? But there are some limitations. So, right, there's only so much you can do with JSON. I mean, I could probably find some way to finagle in while loops or, or something in here, right? But it's just going to be a mess. Um, the other thing about putting uh, this into SQL, um, at least with MySQL, is your the order of your key value pairs is not insured. So, like, maybe, you know, conceptually it would make sense to put um, the type up top, and in this case it, it is there. Um, 
but you know, maybe this base role, for example, I would have liked to have been up here or something. But but my SQL will rearrange these sometimes, right? Uh, so you don't really have line numbers in, in the same way. So and I mean, let's look at this. It's a mess. Like trying to modify these is very cumbersome. Um, I don't have anything that really checks if if I you know made a typo, for example. Um, I could add those things. But that's more things I have to do. Uh, the point is, Antler will do all these things for you. So not only will it let you write something that looks more like code, something you're more familiar with, uh, a little better suited to things like while loops and if checks, um, it will also give you syntax checking and tell you exactly where the errors are, right? It's parsing all of the text. It does it all, right? It does it all for you. Um, the thing that got me, cool, thanks. Uh, the thing that got me on this, um, I mean, I had taken a class in college where we, where we did all this. Uh, and it, it was with a different thing, Yak and, and Lex, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. Anyway, I'd basically forgotten those tools, but I knew I had done it once. It's like, I know I, I can do this, um, but what are the tools? And, and rather than finding, you know, what were the tools we used back then, like, what are the tools today? Because maybe there are new things. Um, and I don't think Antler was around when I was in college. Maybe it was. Uh, but it's a thing I found. It's very similar. It's good. Um, so let's go through it. Assuming that you think you want to learn how to make your own scripting language or programming language, this sounds interesting to you, then uh, let's go ahead. Um, I'll also put a link, uh, I'll put a link to this in the description. Uh, you can, you know, refer back to this. Um, but again, this, this really is like the basic basics. I want to go a little further than, than what this one does. And this is where, again, it might take me a couple of videos. So here's my new C-sharp project. Um, I have also spoilers uh, done this before. Um, so in another project where I fiddled around. So I'll probably be referring back to that sometimes. Um, but the first thing we need to do is install the NuGet packages we need. So there are a couple. Um, Antler is the thing you want to search for, of course. And there are a couple things here. First, we want Antler 4. Second. There is Antler 4 runtime standard and the other things. And you would be forgiven for thinking that like runtime standard is related to runtime or Antler 4 or something based on the namespaces. But in fact, this Antler 4 runtime standard was, um, I think this is the official one. And, the, and it's further ahead. You can see it's version 4.9.3. And then these other ones were made by some other guy, apparently. He kind of spun off and did his own thing um, and hasn't been working on it in a while. But it's the only one I could get to work. <laughs> and so this is a little bit of hesitation. Maybe, um, you know, if you are more stubborn or, or smarter or both than I am, maybe you can figure out how to get this one to work. I couldn't figure out how to get the runtime standard one to work. So I'm going to use runtime. Um, and uh, runtime doesn't depend on Antler 4 itself, but you do need both. Um, so let's install both. One of them is for, so there's two parts here. We're going to type code like this. We're going to type this little grammar, um, which is, you know, a language in and of itself. And the Antler 4, one of these two libraries, I don't remember which is which. This is, again, where I've just kind of stumbled through and made things work. I don't remember which is which, but one of them takes this, takes this that you type, whatever it is that your grammar is for your language, and turns it into a C-sharp class. It's doing, um, I don't know if it's using the code generation or if it's using that TT thing. I don't remember what that stands for. The templated probably is one of those two Ts. Um, but whatever, it uses its code generation technology of some kind to turn this text into a C-sharp class. Uh, we won't look at that C-sharp class. You can dig it up in your like bin, debug, whatever folder. You know, it's, it's in there. Um, but uh, yeah, it's going to, but, but we are, are going to extend the class and use the class that it generates to do, to do this stuff, um, to actually do the, the running. And then the other package, and again, I may have installed these in backwards order. I wasn't really paying attention because again, I don't know which one is which. But the other one is responsible for actually doing everything else, <laughs> as far as I can tell. Again, I could be misspeaking here. Uh, but the point is, you're going to need both of these. Um, Right, implicitly installed. Okay, something included the code generator, so that must do the actual code generation. Anyway, if I sound stupid, I'm sorry, but I promise you, we're going to make a scripting language that can do cool stuff. So actually, and let's start with that. So let's start with, ooh, ooh, other thing, by the way. Well, I'll just show you first. Okay. <laughs> also, you could be, this is just a fun phrase, you could be forgiven for believing that I didn't try and record this before, but in fact, I already did, and horrible static electricity zapped my microphone so many times. It has been snowing here. Um, which doesn't happen that often, and it's been getting very dry, uh, but it's raining today, and I actually have my humidifier running, so I'm hoping there will be no horrible static issues, and I will actually get a video I can publish. Um, so anyway, let's make a file. This is going to be uh, whatever we want our scripting language to be called. I'm going to call it simple. I'm just going to call it simple. And the antler4 files are g4. Where does the g come from? 
I don't know because I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, and you start with, like we saw in this tutorial, by naming the grammar. Uh, the name needs to match the file name. Uh, apparently it will complain if you don't do that. So, whoops, sorry, there we go. Now, you might notice there's some syntax highlighting, and this is what I was going to show you and then cut myself off. Uh, there are plugins for different IDEs. Um, I'm using Writer, you have probably noticed. Um, there is an Antler plugin that gives you syntax uh, highlighting. It lets you do refactors like rename. Um, gives you all these wonderful things. I haven't even used a tenth of them, maybe. Um, but you will want to install this. There is a uh, extension for Visual Studio and VS Code. I am told, based you know from the internet, uh, I haven't tried to use them, but I'm sure they're great. So now we can start defining our grammar. Again, I'm going to define something that's more like I'm going to go for something a little C style. I am also, for the point of demonstration, going to implement a brand new syntax feature that I haven't seen in any programming language. I'm sure it exists in one, and I just don't know it, uh, but not in any I happen to have used. So. I don't know. I'm looking forward to that question mark. Um, but by convention, we will start with with kind of our entry point, if, if you will, for the grammar, which is that we're going to say we're not going to do a chat that's got some lines followed by an end of file, which appears to be a um, predefined. You can see that they've defined like word text. They haven't defined EOF, apparently a built-in thing. Uh, so we will do the same thing. Uh, but I'm going to call it a program. And a program for me, that's interesting, I'm going to have a series of lines. Um, and this uses, if you're not familiar with regex, actually, you're going to have a hard time with uh, Antler. So yeah, if you don't know regular expressions, oh my goodness, you should go learn them because uh, regular expressions are powerful and also dangerous, but very powerful. And um, yeah, you'll definitely be, you know, level up your programming skill by learning regular expressions. So uh, star, I'm not going to explain too much, but star means the previous thing zero or more times, right? So a program is zero or more lines followed by, <laughs> I'm making air quotes, an end of file. Great. Well, what is a line? I'm going to define a line to be one of several possible things. We could have just like a, a one-line statement. Um, for I'm, I'm thinking like a, a function call or a variable declaration. I guess that's it. Um, you could also have, here is regex for an or, uh, a block of some kind. So that's funny. And you can see um, <laughs> this is GitHub Copilot. I'm still using GitHub Copilot. It's making all these fun. Um, suggestions. Um, I don't mind that too bad. Instead of statement, I'm going to call it a block. So we could have an if block. Right, cool, thank you, uh, GitHub Copilot. Or we could have a while block. Also, minor rant about GitHub Copilot, because it was interesting seeing people commenting like, no, GitHub Copilot, all of our, we're all going to lose our jobs. This isn't cool. Um, I don't disagree. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I should link to this video, too. There's a video by CGP Gray called Humans Need Not Apply, and it's a, it, it, he released it when um, self-driving cars were you know, coming up on the horizon. And uh, the example he gave that I thought was so funny, or the analogy was, you know, if you went back in time to when cars were first invented and were talking to horses about it, you'd be like, hey, horses, oh, you got to do all this hard work, but don't worry, we're inventing this cool new thing called cars that's going to make your life so much easier. And in retrospect, of course, it would have been very silly to, you know, you, you could imagine a horse in the time being like, oh, cool, my life will be easier. But, but in fact, as we all know, there are many, many, many fewer horses today than there were back then, right? Cars replaced horses for the most part. Uh, and, and his thing was like self-driving cars is going to replace, you know, Uber, truck drivers, all this stuff, right? Will Copilot do the same for programmers? Yeah, it, pr it probably will. When... Or as that happens, I would rather know how to use Copilot, right? Like, if a horse could have had the skills and the smarts to say, ooh, I'm going to go into car manufacturing, that horse would still be alive, <laughs> right? So I feel like as a programmer, I want to keep working with GitHub Copilot. Uh, I'm going to keep using it because when GitHub Copilot is the thing, I want to be one of the programmers that understands it and uses it. So, so I'm going to keep using it. So anyway, that's my, that's my little, there's my little uh, sidebar rant about Copilot. Um, but anyway, let's go on. So what is a statement? A statement is, and I'm going to do a little parenthetical here thing, um, because I, I mean, well, whatever. Let's go through the thought process. We know it's an assignment. 
I was going to, as I said, it could also be a function call. Um, but something else that I would like to do is I would like to have semicolons be, oops, something a little funny at the end. And this is how you do that. So you, you, you may notice that like this white space is all getting ignored, right? I mean, we can bunch it up like this if that makes you feel better. Um, doesn't matter. The reason for having semicolons, by the way, I mean, we could do new lines, right? If we wanted, we, we could say, look, it's got to be a, um, uh, a new line of some kind, or, or we could say, you know, any combination of, uh, oh, we'd have to define that, sorry, we'd have to do something like this. We'd have to do new line. This is something else I don't quite understand about, um, whoops, I apparently have something else in my clipboard. No, is that not doing it? Okay, I don't remember how this is done. The point is we could. It's weird because I know that they, they were, you can do regular expressions. I do them. Yeah, I've got a great example over here where I define an identifier using regular expressions. So I don't know what's going on there. Um, regardless, we could say that a new line ends our lines. I'm going to do a semicolon. Um, but what I was saying before is you should, it's got to be something, right? Otherwise the code, it, it'll be ambiguous um, in some cases, whether your code is meant to span multiple lines, um, you know, whether the new line matters. So, so I don't know, I could probably, I could write out an example. I'm trying to think of an example. Let's write some fake uh, C or something and find one. If you're like var C equals four and pretend there were no semicolons and then you said, I don't know, here's a while block or something, uh, while true. Well, semicolon, or sorry, you didn't have semicolons. But right, if you don't, this would look bad if you're ignoring white space, or even if you're not ignoring white space, or sorry, you are ignoring, you're not ignoring, whatever, right? God, this is a terrible example. I'm having trouble thinking of an example. I ran into it as I was coding it, and I wish you could remember, but the point is you're going to need some sort of delimiter. You can't just rely on white space because there come these ambiguous points in your code where it's like, uh, is that, you know, an, an or operator or, or something or, or an and or a plus or actually that's, that's maybe an example you could come up with like four minus, or maybe that's one. I don't know. You know what? Okay. Gosh, I shouldn't have even said this because I don't have a great example off the top of my head. The point is you're going to need some sort of delimiter for your statements or else you start getting into problems. Um, and it was interesting to run into that as I was trying to make my own language. So if you want to run into it yourself, leave this off and see what happens. Um, but it's interesting to run into it and be like, oh, that's why they have to have something, you know, in these programming languages. Uh, speaking of white space, we can skip white space. And this is where I know that regular expressions work. Um, I would like to also skip ours, um, which is carriage return, right, and new line. And this is a little bit of antler for magic that says, I'm not even going to tell you about that. And you'll see when we, when we get to the C-sharp code that's generated by antler, this white space rule will be totally vanished, right? We, we, we won't see it in our, in our C-sharp code. Maybe there's a way to poke at it, but for the most part, you know, if you really wanted to, maybe you can dig into it. But in all the other places where you're commonly going to be um, looking at the code as it evaluates it. This will make more sense when we get to C-sharp code. Um, we won't see the white space. So yeah, so let's skip white space since we were talking about it. Um, but we need to define these other things. So, and yes, I was moving my mouse off screen so I could scroll up and look at my other grammar. Um, let's define if blocks. We know we're going to want them. And if block is uh, the word if. Ooh, uh, thank you. <laughs> Funny um, GitHub Copilot. So this looks pretty good. Yeah, we would say if some kind of expression, I'm actually going to choose not to have the parentheses. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I kind of ran into it's like, oh, here's why I have to have a semicolon. I didn't run into anything that explained to me why I had to have parentheses around this expression. So I just left them off. Maybe as I continue to develop this language or you do the same, you will run into cases where you're like, ah, I need to have those parentheses. I wasn't running into one. Uh, then we're going to have just a regular old block, right? Not an if block or while block. Uh, we could have maybe a block of code. So that would be like in C sharp, you know, if you're like var i equals three, and then you just for no reason in particular decided to make a block, right? That is something you could do. That would be a block. I'm not going to allow those in my language. I think that's silly if you do that. Um, maybe there's funny variable scope reasons. I don't know. I don't think I have ever in all my time of programming done that for any sort of real reason. So I'm going to say, no, you can't do those kinds of blocks. If, if you're doing a block, it better be some sort of if or while, right? That's what I'm going to say for my language. Maybe I'll leave this down here just so we can continue to play with fake code. Um, so if some kind of expression, um, you know, a function call, um, 
you know, a Boolean thing or, or whatever, something that returns an integer. Maybe you can just say if an integer, you know, and, and do some sort of check on that. And we, we get to define those rules, right? Like, what if you say if in a string? Maybe in your language you want an empty string to say no, that fails, and any non-empty string to say no, that passes. Or maybe you don't want to allow strings. We're going to get to choose all those things when we, once we get to the C-sharp side. Um, some kind of expression. Then we're going to have one of these blocks of code, right, following the expression. And then, if you want, you could have an else followed by a block. Um, but that's not necessarily true. It wouldn't be just a block. I'm going to call this an else if block, uh, by which I mean it could just be a straight up block, but it could be another if block, right? So here's what I'm saying. You could say if expression have a block, and then maybe you could have else, and then you would have either a block, right, and do another block, or you would have another if block where you say if expression and then you keep going, right? So this will allow us to chain as many of these else ifs in a row, just like this, um, with just one else. Uh, we don't need to do a star here to say as many as you want, because this is a recursive thing. This is going to keep, you know, you can keep going until you hit a block at the end. So that'll, that'll do it for that rule. Um, let's finally define what a block is. So a block is just a curly brace. Um, Rather than a statement, you know, it's any number of lines, and I guess you could have none, and then another curly block, block right? That makes sense, because you could have inside your if block, obviously, a while block or an if block. Um, yeah, or just some straight up statements like i equals 4. Okay, perfect. Uh, maybe we should say what a while block looks like, and here I want to do something a little bit different. Rather than saying while, for this language, I'm going to choose to support both while and unless, which I think, I know I've used a basic, or <laughs> I know I've used a language that uses it, I think maybe it was basic, <laughs> that's why I said basic early. Um, I think so. So anyway, let's, I'm going to make a little word like this, all caps. Um, and this is again where my antler knowledge kind of falls apart. What is the meaning here of having ones in all caps and not. I mean, I'll, I'll show you the difference. Again, it kind of like made sense to me. I've, I've been able to sort of intuit an understanding by working with Antler 4, but I don't actually know. I don't know. They must have a special name. I don't know what they are. Um, if you name one of these things, by the way, with a capital letter at the beginning, right, that's what changes the behavior. And they have different rules. Antler only allows you to do certain things, like um, you definitely can't use, yeah, those... Um, regexes in the non uppercased ones. <laughs> if you again, if you want to have a complete understanding of Antler 4, you're going to have to go look that up on your own because I only got, whoops, uh, enough to get by. So yes, a block. And here's where I want to do something that I haven't seen any language do before. But I every now and again, I run into this in code and I want to do it. Here's what I'm saying. Maybe I say, while i is uh, less than 4, I'm going to do something. Let's say that I came from I don't know what. But what if I wanted to say, what if that never happened? What if, what if from the very start this condition wasn't met? Then I would do an else. This would be equivalent to writing if I was less than four. Basically what I want is a shortcut for this. Right? I have occasionally run into this, and I don't know if that, maybe that's a code smell. Maybe that means I'm doing something wrong. It is very rare. I can't even remember the last time I've been like, oh, I wish I could like just put an else right after the while, right? But because now I can, right? I'm writing my own language. I can do whatever the hell I want. So I'm going to say, yes, let's have an else uh, followed by an else if block. So same thing, it will be an else if. So if you wanted to, again, in our language, you're going to be able to write else, and you could put an if here if you wanted. You could either do else and do a block, or you could do an else, uh, you could do an if block, um, whatever you want to do. And then you could just keep going, right? <laughs> so that's going to be a feature of this language, which I'm calling simple. Um, you can like it or you can not. You know, you can do what you want. We're making our own language. It's great. Um, let's go ahead and do assignment. I'll kind of take these in order. Uh, that looks great. So it's an identifier uh, followed by an expression. Well, what's an identifier? I'm surprised it's not complaining about that. Ooh, also, haha, I got ahead. What's a while? I want to support both while and unless. Or until, while this is true, until this is true. Yeah, we could do until. 
while this thing is true, until this thing is true. Sure, whatever word you want, right? We can choose. Uh, I mean, you could even support all of them if you wanted to and handle that in the C-sharp side, but let's just do two of them. Um, all right, an identifier, what is an identifier? Um, an identifier, I'm actually gonna put this down here with this stuff. Uh, an identifier is a bunch of letters, ooh, that'll do copilot. So you gotta start with a letter and underscore, and then you can have letters or numbers. Um, maybe, and maybe in your language you decide, you know what, maybe I want to allow you to have numbers, but this could get you in trouble. Um, you have to have at least one letter, otherwise it's going to be uh, indistinguishable from an integer, right? Um, so this is a little bit of a dangerous rule to do. I mean, you could do something like, you know, have an or statement and do something else where you allow numbers as long as there's a letter in there somewhere, you know, you could do something. Um, I'm not going to bother to write out that regex. I don't feel like I need to support that. I'm just going to say, you know what, letters, underscores, and then numbers as long as they're not at the start. That'll be our regex for an identifier. Um, all right, we've got an assignment. Oh, we should do the function call. Yep, function call up there. So a function call is going to look a little interesting. We'll have, again, another thing. And oh my god, is this what we want? So any kind of expression, which again could be, you know, anything that resolves to a value, basically, um, of some kind, we don't know what, and then optionally some kind of extra list of parameters, but I'm going to say also that whole thing is optional. We don't even need that first one, right? But if you do have the first one, or sorry, you can't have the extras unless you have the first one, right? Does this make sense? I, I realize that this series of characters is a little barfy, but <laughs> that's regular expressions for you. Um, all right, looks like we should finally define what an expression is, and this is where things get a little more exciting. Um, so I'm going to do my definition like this. This is something you'll see sometimes in um, when people are defining things, right? Previously, we've kind of had it all in one line. Again, white space doesn't matter in this, in this language as well as in ours because we're skipping it. Um, wow, yeah, I guess there must be an antler thing that defines antler grammar. Why not? Uh, but anyway, so what are the possible things that we might have? Um, there might be some things that I would call constants. So, um, sure, we'll just spell out the whole word. Uh, so that could be, you know, a straight up, a, a literal number or a string. Um, the words true or false. The word null, I think, would also count. Um, identifier, that's a good pick. We would also allow identifiers. Um, yes, a function call will do. You could call a function and get a result, and that could be an expression. And an expression, maybe I could have called this value. Maybe that would have made more sense. But um, here's where things are going to get a little more exciting. Well, this is that much more exciting. So we're going to want um, parenthetical. And the order here, by the way, is important. So when um, Antler is parsing your 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 code that you have written, which we haven't written. I mean, here's our pseudocode, right? This is what our language is going to look like, except I'm not going to use vars. Um, as it's parsing these, it's going to be looking at these in order to see which one matches first. Um, so the order here is important. Uh, we want to look at, for example, constants before identifiers, because if you have written the text true as, a, as one of your constants, and let's go ahead and write those, what is a constant? Well, it could be, oh yeah, look at that, true, false, null, a number. I think I actually want to do it the way it was suggesting here. Inger, float, string, sure, a boolean or null. Yeah, let's say those. Um, we want it to match on those first before an identifier. Otherwise, it would think the text true is an identifier. So let me finish typing this out, right? A bool is true or false, but this rule would also match the words true or false. Um, so we definitely want them to be first. And I don't quite remember which is more important, but it is also important that we match here constant matches true or false before identifier. What I'm saying is, if we put this up here, then true and false would be matches identifiers and not booleans because this rule would match first. This is a little bit like regex rules as well, where the first thing that matches is the thing that counts as the match. Um, so, so the order is important. Uh, I, sorry, so I think that's where the, the order here is important. This order is going to become important um, when we start having rules like, well, let's do a not expression as well. Uh, but let's do, yeah, so let's keep suggesting this, right? Here's where the order is going to become important for, for within this one rule. Um, GitHub Copilot is suggesting a plus. 
we don't want to consider pluses first. We would want to we would want to do multiplications first. Um, so we'll want expression, and there's actually a couple multiplications. I'm going to make sure mult op that works for me. Um, add op. Okay, here we go. Compare. Yes, that works for me. Um, I'm going to say a bool operator as well. So this would be and and or. And so again, the order is important here because this thing is going to be recursive, right? You can have expressions within expressions within expressions. And we want the multiplying expressions to get matched first so that when you have a string like this, it doesn't match the 1 plus 1 first. That would get you in trouble because 1 plus 1 times 4 is not 2 times 4. It's 1 plus 4, right? <laughs> we need the multiplication to happen first. And so that is why we must have the multiplication first here. And in order for true and false to be matched before identifiers, we must define that rule before this rule. So the order is important in how you define these things in Antler. Um, I think that's it. If I look over here, it looks like I've caught everything. Oh, but what's all this? So let's talk about that. So here's the other thing um, that will make a little more sense in C sharp once we get to the C sharp side. Uh, I think we're kind of almost done. Um, we can give all of these names, and we could have done it here too, like. I don't know, suppose you wanted to call this while. Uh, does it not like that for some reason? Maybe it needs to be on separate lines. I don't know. Oh, no, actually, it's going to say you can't name one thing if you don't name them all. Something like that. Oh, or maybe you can't do it for these uppercase things. I don't know. The point is, <laughs> we can name these things. And that will be helpful for us in C sharp. Because on the C sharp side, what's going to happen is for each of these not uppercase things, <laughs> to use the technical term, you're going to write a visitor function that says, when we encounter one of these, as we're parsing your, your code, right? As, you, as we're parsing this, when we encounter, for example, while, what should we do? And so there's going to be a function called visit while block. Great. We're not going to have visit anything else um, that happens to be uh, defined in here um, individually. I mean, we could. Well, I mean, that's not true. We'll have a visit block. But what am I trying to say? you wouldn't be able to pull these out individually quite as easily. I'll show you in the C-sharp. It'll make more sense when we're in the C-sharp. But by naming these, by calling this, like let's call this a constant expression, and let's call this an identifier expression. And we're just going to let GitHub do it for us, GitHub Copilot. Um, great. Uh, so now what we're going to be able to say, rather than just listening for an expression in general and having to handle all these or cases and be like, well, was it a constant that we matched? Was it this that we matched? Was it that that we matched? Um, we're going to be able to say just, just for this thing, <laughs> we just want, when we're doing expressions, we want to, we're never, we don't want to handle expressions as a whole. We want to handle the individual bits and that's going to make our code look a lot nicer. So you you can give names to these things. Again, I think it will become more clear when we're in the C-sharp side. Um, let me pause the video maybe and, well, you know what, I don't have to do that. Let's just uh, copy paste. So let me do that at the bottom here. Um, I'm going to copy paste from the thing I already wrote. So we have, for example, these operators. Um, I called them something slightly different in my previous thing. So let's name them what we've been calling them here. You can call them whatever you want. Uh, what's a Boolean operator? I'm going to have a few of those. I'm going to want to and or or XOR, those are all good. Um, there isn't a particular reason to do this. I don't actually know why, now that I'm copy pasting this, why I chose to split these out. I think it would've been fine uh, to have done it the other way, but that's fine, we'll, we'll keep up with that. Um, here are our constants, integer, float, string, bool, or null. So integer, float, string, bool, or null would be these. So an integer, any digits. Um, I could imagine, you know, if you wanted in your language to say, look, you can't start with a zero for your integers or something. I'm going to go ahead and allow it. Um, you know, some languages, uh, if you start a number with an with a zero, that means it's octal or hex or other things. So, but we're not going to do anything so fancy, um, or at least I'm not in this video. You can, if you you know so choose. You can make any language you want. Here's how I'm going to define strings. We're going to say it's a quote, any number of non quotes. This is not regex syntax I'm used to. I would have written uh, not a quote. Um, but I had trouble doing that, and I don't remember why. Uh, but I found this online when people talk about Antler and was like, okay, I'll believe you, and it has worked. Again, I'm just stumbling through it. I also wanted to support because uh, this doesn't support escaping quotes. You know, like in, in C sharp, you could do something like, you know, uh, 
name equals John nickname whatever right uh, you can you can escape your quotes right <laughs> uh, I have not added support for that so to kind of help you out I've said well you can use single quotes instead if you want and this would also be a valid string and this is very JavaScripty right so I'm going to allow that kind of construction I'll just leave that down there I guess uh, bool we're saying is true or false I also want to do nulls um, I don't know Nulls are kind of useful, kind of dangerous. Maybe you don't like nulls in your language. Super fair. You can leave them out if you want. Um, you will need some significant changes once we get to the C-sharp side from what I'm going to do, though. There is a... Uh, I kind of felt a little forced to use a null, but, but it, you're not actually. You can totally do without it. Um, and I think that's all the rules. Nothing is left squiggly underlined. All right. And this was maybe the boring part? I mean, you know, okay, we've defined a language. Cool. But we can't actually use it, right? <laughs> like, what does that mean? Um, let's do a couple things. Let's do, let's pull this out. Let's make a script that we're going to want to run. Um, so let's just, I'm going to put it in here too. Uh, I'm going to call this uh, test. And because this is called simple, I'm going to do ss for simple script. Um, you call it whatever you want, dot simple, I don't know. Uh, and so here is a simple script file that we would like to execute. Oh, we should also demonstrate calling some functions. So let's write, um, yeah, let's write some things. Let's try something like this. We'll say, uh, write, um, I isn't, ooh, okay, let's use double quotes. Uh, I isn't big enough. Uh, it's just the number I. Uh, so let's make it bigger. All right, that will be, we're going to call a function called write. Again, the white space, you know, it's white space insensitive, so we can do whatever we want here. We could do this kind of nonsense if we wanted. Um, all right, I isn't big enough. Let's make it bigger. We're going to make it bigger. Uh, we don't actually need to assign this. And spoilers, I haven't figured out doing, um, uh, fun first of all, defining your own functions, uh, but also block level scopes for variables, right? So this would actually define and uh, haha, we don't actually do var many times, this would, um, this name variable would persist outside the loop, is what I'm saying. Um, so it's a little funky there. I don't know, I'm going to put it out here. Uh, so let's make it bigger, this will make it bigger. And then here we could say, just to again hammer home, home what this is for, we would say uh, i is, was uh, plenty big to begin with. Okay, nothing to be done. And now I'll say, uh, sure, i is, I don't know, let's say I. Okay, I'll put a period at the end. Okay, this can be our program, and if we want to tweak the value to test like, is this while loop running, we could try doing a one. Actually, let's make this go a little larger because we have this funny math I did apparently. If one plus one times four, we'll be able to test that operation, right, the order of operations is being handled properly. Um, let's in fact do it this way. So if we start at one, we're gonna say, okay, that's less than eight. And we're going to say, okay, one plus four, if we're doing our math right, right? <laughs> so we should get five, which still isn't big enough. So then we would do, okay, five plus four is nine. So we should end up at nine. Um, but if our math is happening in the wrong order, then we're going to do one times four is eight. And we'll only do this loop once. And so we'll end up with an eight here and not a nine, right? So if our logic is working, we should see nine. If it's not working, we should see eight in terms of order of operations. Uh, so that'll be a helpful little test. It's a little weird to unpack. I just made this example up on the fly. Uh, the example I had uh, before had to do with like mangoes and stuff. So different example. That's okay. We'll roll with it. Uh, okay. Sounds good. Yeah, we'll test assigning names. Why not? Um, and actually, let's try, let's do like, just, just as an early test that our, our thing is working. So these are some straight up assignments. But let's try assignments with math in them kind of immediately, we can add breakpoints and we'll see that, that that's working in our C-sharp code. Okay, let's build. I haven't written any real code yet, um, but I'm going to do a build on this project. Ooh, but I can't yet uh, because this needs to be, what was this like type or output type? Yeah, output type exe, thank you. Um, whoops. Ooh, also I happen to like uh, warnings as, error, as errors. Uh, for my nullable reference type. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, this is correct. We do want to include the G4. Um, that will get built. The other thing, what's going on here? I'm just going to try and build. I'm, I'm not sure what's happening. 
The other thing I want to do is that test ss should be copied into my output directory. Ah, yeah, there's no entry point. Fair point. There is no entry point. Um, before doing that, I am going to want this to be copied into the output directory because we're going to want our you know, compiled exe to be able to locate this file. So uh, let's just, I'll just do copy if always. It's fine. OK, so let's make our entry point. Um, I'm going to use the C sharp. Is it 9 I think they introduced these? I always get confused. I really only started doing it with C sharp 10, but I think it was available in 9, where you don't have to define a class or a static main. You can just start typing code. Um, I think that means we can now get away with doing nothing. Is it going to say, yeah, that's cool? No. Do we have to type something? Do we have to say, like, var i equals 0? Is that going to make it happy? What do we have to do here? Why are you angry? Top level statements must precede namespace and type declarations. OK. OK, build. OK. And seeing this, so this we understand. i is assigned, but its value is never used. Makes sense, because we did that. What is all this? These are all warnings created, or whatever, <laughs> found <laughs> by writer in the code that was generated by G4. Again, or sorry, Antler. It has taken our G4 file, the description of our grammar. Ooh, that's probably what G stands for. And turned it into a class that lives somewhere. Again, it's like in the bin output directory. We could find it. I don't know. It's whatever. It's there. You can find it if you want to look at it. It's like a .g.cs file. That's what the generated uh, files have as an extension. Um, so anyway, it's it's generated one of those. It's got all these fun warnings. We don't super care. Uh, what we want to do now is make something that will extend the class that they have generated for us. So let me do this. This is going to be our visitor. So again, I mentioned that like, right? What, how are we going to make sense of, of our of our script as it comes in? Well, we want to, when we hit an assignment statement, to do something. So how do we do that? We're going to make a listener for an assignment. And, and they call these listeners visitors. When we visit an assignment, we will execute whatever logic we want. Again, that could be to generate um, you know, an actual opcode for you know, some assembly, if that's what you want to do, if you're making a compiler. Um, we're just going to do interpreting. And we're going to well, you know, we'll just keep a dictionary of all the values at runtime and just go. It'll be an interpreted language. So let's make that visitor. Do, 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 do. And I guess I'll call it simple visitor. Seems like a good name. Uh, so this must extend the class. They've made a simple base visitor. And that name, of course, is based on the fact that we called our thing simple. Our grammar is called simple, so they've made a simple base visitor. And here's where you must make a super important decision. Um, I'm going to use object nullable, which, again, is why I mentioned we're going to need null. You can make whatever you want here. The point is, this is what every when we visit, Every single visit function is going to return something. What do you want it to return? Um, so for example, when we visit an expression, what should that expression return? Well, in this case, maybe you'd say, oh, it's a while loop. I would want it to return Booleans. Um, but what if it was actually something here in an assignment? You might want this expression to be able to return a string, because you're assigning a string. Or you might want it to return an integer, because it's assigning an integer, right? So to account for everything, I'm going to have to return something more generic right, than a bool or whatever. So I'm going to return an object. Um, and in my case, I'm going to return nulls because I would like a lot of my statements to not really return anything. Like an assignment statement in and of itself, I don't think should have a return value. Um, in some languages, they do. I think this is valid in C-sharp, maybe not. But you could do like while you know um, line equals file read line. Um, I don't remember if the, I haven't done it in so long. I don't remember if you can do this in, in C sharp. You can certainly do it in other languages. But as long as this is getting something out of reline, this evaluates true. And so this is a fun little expression, you know, that you can write instead of having to do something like, uh, you know, line equals file file read line, and then say, or actually, what you would really do <laughs> is you would say while wow, file has more contents or something. And then you would read in lines, right? That's how you do it for more modern things. Um, again, I know this is valid in some languages, so we could decide that it's valid in ours. Maybe we would like our assignments, therefore, to return something Boolean so that this while would execute. I'm going to say no. I'm not going to do that in my language. That's the decision I'm making. Again, you can make a different decision. So I'm going to have my assignments just return null. Um, and I think that when you have a function call that doesn't return anything, Right? It's like, well, is that a void? Uh, I'm just going to do null. That's what my functions will return if they don't return anything. Um, so for those reasons, I have 
I'm going to say, look, everything, every visitor is going to return a nullable object. The alternative, the other thing you can do if you want to be a little more clever, is you could make your own value type. So I don't know, let's call it a uh, simple value. And you could you could always return simple values. And then in here, you could uh, have all kinds of things, like maybe um, whether or not something is constant. Uh, so you know you shouldn't be able to reassign it or something. Um, you know the value as an object, but maybe you also keep some sort of type where you have a you know a type enum uh, that you make up for all the types, and and then you might make some functions. So whatever, right? You can make your own object to kind of do some more fancy things. Um, for the purposes of this video, I'm not going to do that. I would probably do that in the future when I play with this stuff more. But for now, I'm just going to use nullable objects and that's going to be good enough. Uh, so let's go ahead and now do some things. I think the easiest thing to start with would be an assignment. So as I mentioned, right, what's going to happen when you visit an assignment? Here's how you do it. You override and they have generated, again, for all those named not starting with an uppercase things, <laughs> right, expression, we're not going to have like a visit um, null or something or visit bool uh, right just the bool thing or int but all of those lowercase starting named ones we have visitors for so we can visit an assignment and we're going to get this context uh, which has all kinds of properties in it that are the various bits of the rule over here right so an assignment has an identifier it has this equal sign and it has this expression we can find the identifier we can find the expression uh, gives us a function because it's another thing in the tree. And you can, I think, even get that equal sign. I think it's something else that does one of these terminal nodes. Yeah, it might be get token, get tokens. It's one of these. Um, I haven't tried using those in general. What I've seen other people do, so again, I'm just kind of copying, again, not really knowing antler best practices myself, is if you want to grab the thing, giving it a name is going to be a lot easier, um, right? Like while, if you want to grab the string while or until, right? That is easier to grab than if we did this. That would be harder to pull out of that while block because we have to go looking through those tokens. So by putting it on this thing called while, we can now say, once we're handling while blocks, we'll say, okay, what's the while property inside this context? Um, but anyway, we're working on assignments now, so we'll get there when we, when we, when we get to whiles. Uh, but let's do identifier. So identifier equals expression. So we need the identifier. You can just get text of almost anything, and it will uh, it will travel down the whole tree. So like identifier is, well, what's identifier? Identifier is one of these things. So whatever that match was, whatever the text is, it's going to give you the text of the identifier. You could call get text on like the whole assignment, and it will give you presumably whatever text matched. I don't know if it's going to be sanitized text or the text exactly as written, right? So if I had like something like this, is it going to give me J equals space, space, space? Or does it give me like the super sanitized one? I don't know. I haven't tried. But you can call get text kind of any level and it will just go down and say, okay, here's the text. Um, so anyway, this would be our var name, right? That's our identifier. Um, and then, yep, this is very true. GitHub Copilot is helping out. So Visit is a function in that you know lives in this class that was generated, um, or actually it might live even further down. Yeah, the thing that the thing that simple base visitor extends somewhere down there is visit, and visit just says you know I don't know what this expression is exactly. Um, if we go back here, we can see right an expression could be any of this nonsense. We just say ah just you figure it out grammar thing antler go and visit it and, you know, call the appropriate visit function for me, find the result, right? In this case, for example, assignment is going to return, we're going to return a null, spoilers, let's go ahead and do that. Um, find me that value, which is going to be another object question mark, because again, that's what all the visitors return here. Uh, so, okay, we got it. What do we want to do with this value now that we have it? We're going to want to store it somewhere. So let's make, as I mentioned, a dictionary. We're just going to call this, whoops, variables. Uh, I'll make this a new dictionary and we'll just store it in there. So variables var name equals value. Again, interpreted language. We don't know the type. We don't even have to care. We're going to store everything as object question mark. It's going to be a little bit of a mess for us. <laughs> Your value type could help. Um, 
but again, like we can't say everything is booleans. I mean, I guess we could. That'd be a tricky language to work with, right? Everything is integers. You could, um, but we probably want to do a little bit more. So anyway, we don't have to care at this point. We're going to have to care later, but we don't have to care right now. Whatever the value is, shove it in our little dictionary. Great. Wonderful. Um, what are some other things we might like to visit? Um, let's, let's do some of these expressions. And, and so let's, um, and, and actually, you know what we should do now. Let's add a breakpoint. Let me close this stuff because I don't need it all. Um, and I want to rename this. Well, okay, I'll get there when I get there. Oh, haha, <laughs> in fact, okay, sorry, my brain is going in a million directions. Okay, there is some boilerplate I mentioned to get this thing running, right? So we've written this visitor class. What I would like to do is add a breakpoint and see, wow, am I really visiting an assignment, right? I have an assignment right here, i equals one. In theory, when this code is executed, I ought to see i, I ought to see one, I ought to see that thrown into my dictionary, ada, ada, ada. That word is sounding not like a word anymore. Um, so I would like to run the program and see that happen, but right now when I run the program, all I'm going to do is this nonsense. So my breakpoint here is never going to get hit. <laughs> so how do we actually execute it? There is a bunch of exciting boilerplate here. Let's go ahead and copy paste it and go through it and modify it for our needs. Oops, we don't need this anymore. I'll just close that. Um, all right. We're going to need an Antler input stream. Sure. Um, seems reasonable. Uh, in this case, if we look at the code, they're getting the user to input the code and they parse the code, apparently until you press Control D. Sure. I would like to read the contents of this test SS. So what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to have a file name. And we could pull this in from the arguments, uh, you know, command line arguments, but I would like to just be able to hit debug here and not set all that stuff up. So for now, for the entire video, I'm just going to hard code it. But you could imagine this being arg zero. Um, so let's, oh, and let's do the file contents. We'll say um, file contents. I think maybe it was suggesting something reasonable there, but I'm just going to do file read all text. Yep, that'll do. And then that is what we will pass in, not what the user is in typing, but that thing. All right, speak lexer. Again, if we go back to this example, they called their language speak. So that's why everything is speak. We have called our language simple. So everywhere we see speak, uh, we can do simple instead. Um, I'm going to use the little C sharp things, um, var. Uh, but this will be a simple lexer. And this will be a simple parser. And this will be a simple visitor, um, which is the thing that we actually coded up over here, simple visitor. So if we had called this simple interpreter, let's say, then this would be simple interpreter in this case. Um, var, 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 var. All right. What's this dot chat? Dot chat is because he wants to start executing the first chat that's found. Um, I, I assume you could start anywhere and say, yeah, let's just start from the fragment A or something. Or I don't even fragment A. I don't even know what fragments are, to be honest. I haven't messed with those. Um, you could presumably start with anything. Uh, in our language, we start with what we called a program. Right, it's the only unused thing here, unused parser rule. Right, well, we're about to use it. Um, I don't think it's going to know that we have used it in that sense. Yeah, but we are. We're going to start, you know, get the program from, from our parser, uh, then do the visiting logic, uh, visit a chat context. Let's not call that a chat context. We'll call that a, uh, I don't know, sim I guess that will be a simple context. Oops. Uh, let's call this a simple lexer. <laughs> And let's call this a simple parser. OK. So again, what exactly does all this code do? I don't know. I can kind of intuit it by looking. I haven't read the Antler 4 documentation to understand why I need to do this particular thing. Um, spoilers when you want to do error handling for syn syntax error handling specifically, uh, you can attach the simple parser a error listener. Um, and that's where you'll get all kinds of information on like what exactly was the line that the error was on, what you know, character was it expecting or whatever based on your grammar. So you get all that, you know, just like you, you expect to see for, from build errors. It'll tell you, hey, here's the problem. Here's the line. Um, fix it. Uh, so you can add all that there. If you don't do any error handling, by the way, it'll just parse to the best of its ability, which I think of like kind of like HTML, right? It's like, ah, you missed a closing P tag. It's cool. Let's just keep going, right? Um, so that's the default behavior of Antler as well. Uh, so if you don't want to do that, then in your um, error catcher thing, you need to, you know, see, oh, did I catch any errors, you know, in my error catcher? If so, let's not 
continue. Um, let's not do this stuff. Um, but anyway, I'm not going to do that for now. Here's all this fun boilerplate that we barely understand. Sounds great. Let's see if we can hit this breakpoint. That's what we would actually like to do. Oh my goodness. How long has this video been recording, by the way? Almost an hour. Uh, couldn't find the file. Ah, yes. Super true. You, viewer, probably noticed we need to specify the path. I know I could use a forward slash there, but I'm being stubborn. Okay, cool. We hit a null. What do we got? Ah, here we go. Var name is I. Uh, value is null, right? That's a problem. I was just saying I would expect to see a one, but again, we said visit an expression. And because we haven't overridden visit expression, which we can do, or actually, well, anyway, we don't have any other visitors. So it's just the default, which is just going to be return null. Um, and if we look at visit children, you could dig your way down. It's just returning the default value for this type, which is a null. So, okay, our value is null. So in our dictionary, we're just going to have um, i equals null which is half right. <laughs> the i part is right, but not the null part. So let's stop here and override what would get us that value. So if we go back and look at our expression, what would we like to do? We would like a constant. So we have this constant expression. Uh, constant is down here. Inger, float, string, bool, and null. Um, so we can do this a couple ways. The way that I've been doing in the past is saying, I'm gonna handle the constant expression. I'm pretty sure that we can just handle the constant straight up and do that. Again, we can't handle integer, float, string, bool, or null. We can handle constants. So let's, let's try that. I don't, I'm not 100% that's actually going to work, but um, we're going to visit constant. So this, here's where we have a fun uh, example where, if you go back here, a constant could be an integer or a float or a string or a bool or a null. It could be any of these. Which one is it? We don't know. Right? We have to find out. Um, and so you can ask the context. So here we would say, if the context, and let's look at like, for example, well, let's look at integer first. If this is, or rather if it's not null, then we know it's got a thing. So we could say integer get text. And that would give us the text. Uh, what we would like to do is return parsing it. And that'll do. Uh, I feel a little gross about double context integer here, so I'm going to say if it's a thing, and I'll just call it i, uh, then I'm going to do i get text. So I would just like to reduce the number of calls I make to that function. The most minor of concerns, honestly, but that's how I'm going to do it. Float. Sounds good. What would you like to do here? Hmm, IDE doesn't have a suggestion yet. Or rather, GitHub Copilot. All right. String. Yep, yeah, that's another thing we would like to do. Uh, we'd like to do something a little different here. I'm curious to see if it'll Okay, so yes, this is very much what we want to do, right? We need the text of the string, and we want to skip the first and last character because we've got quotes. Um, but we can do something way cooler because, yeah, there we go. <laughs> we can do that. Uh, why, oh, whoops, parentheses. Um, and I forget what, at what version of C Sharp they introduced this, but from the first character, right, where zero index, two, one less than the end, pull out all those. Looks nice and succinct. We don't have to, you know, I don't know how it works under the hood, but from our point of view, it looks like we're not calling get text length. So that's cool. Maybe it's more efficient. I don't actually know. Uh, what are the other things we've got here? Bool, true, and false. All right. So if the context, whoops, if we've got a bool, do the same thing, uh, b, then we're going to return, yeah, exactly. Thank you, copilot. We would want to return if the text is true then we will return get text. By the way, this is um, case sensitive, our language so far. Um, you may have noticed over here, they said, we're gonna define capital A as being either the uppercase or lowercase, blah, 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 blah. I assume fragments are for this stuff. Um, so the point is this will match says whether you type it capital, all caps, all lowercase, a crazy weird ass mix where like the S is lowercase, the A, you know, whatever you want, it's gonna support. I haven't gone that far. You better have typed literally under, you know, lowercase true, lowercase false, that's it. If you type true with a capital T, that's a variable name now, which could be confusing. So, you know, you might want to, um, right? And rather than having to do, uh, I'm going to cover all the cases and you're like, oh, but what about, uh, you know, whatever, right? right. We wouldn't want to do all that. Um, so you can do 
this stuff with fragments, which I haven't used, so I'm not even going to try to at this point. Um, but fine, I'm just going to go for all lowercase. You can make your language more convenient. Uh, the final thing we'd want to do is if it's null, um, and this is kind of funny, if the null has anything, then we return null, which is kind of silly. But if we look at our grammar, integer float string bool null, integer float string bool null, we really don't have to do anything else. Um, we could just say return null because we know that's the only other case. But to be a little future proof, in case I want to add other types in the future, um, that's fine. I'll throw an unimplemented exception. I, that was not what I would have picked. And I think if we look at my old code, we'll see that that's not what I picked. Um, I just threw an exception and said unknown value type. But uh, whatever. <laughs> we'll do um, not implemented exception. That seems like a reasonable thing to me. So let's try debugging again. And now I hope we'll see that when we hit that breakpoint, value equals one. And if we look at our variables, oh my god, we have a string. We have a key, sorry, a variable called i with a value of one. Incredible. Let's go to the next breakpoint. I don't remember what's... Okay, John nickname whatever. Name is John nickname whatever, so we've parsed strings properly. Wonderful. What's the next thing? Uh, value of one for var j. And if we look at our... Um, let's close that. If we look at this, j equals one. Hmm, why did we get one? Well, we haven't told it how to add yet. That's a problem. Uh, we also haven't told it how to pull a value out of a pre-existing variable, so we're going to have to do that. Um, and then we're going to have to tell it how to, how to add. That's going to be more visitors. So let's write those visitors. Um, and this is what I love about this visitor thing too, by the way. So a couple a couple things. A, a cool thing and a gotcha thing. The cool thing is we can extend this language pretty easily, uh, add new things, and we can just you know implement them in this incremental fashion, which I mean to me just feels great, right? At no point do we have to have a whole working thing we can define as much language as we want and then just go through and implement it one piece at a time until we're done. Um, if we were trying to do string parsing, I think that you, you, know, you, you wouldn't be in that state as, as early. So this, I feel like this gets you in a good, like, I don't know if flow is quite, quite you know, the right term here. I might be misusing that in this instance. I'm thinking of like game flow where you're, you know, you're just like, you're, you're just in the zone. Um, it's, I don't think it's quite that, but it is, it is close. You're just, you're just going one piece at a time. Bam, 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 done. Feels great. So I love that. The gotcha is that if you were ever to rename something, like suppose for whatever reason you didn't like, I don't know, you were like, I'm going to call us, I'm trying to save characters for some reason. I'm going to call this a sign. Now when you build, it's going to change the name of your code, and you no longer have, we haven't actually overridden anything. There is no visit assignment anymore. There's visit a sign or whatever, and there is in the sign context, right, all this stuff. So when you rename, and maybe other IDEs are actually like super cool and rename both. I don't know how, I don't know, maybe you can figure that out, right? But that, it doesn't work here. Uh, if you rename something in here, you're going to screw up your, your C-sharp code. Um, so anyway, again, there could be other other IDEs or other plugins. Maybe another plugin comes out for Rider that does Antler 4. Maybe they, they handle that for you. Uh, this one doesn't. So it, uh, you, you might want some good names to start. <laughs> there's, there's a small cost to pay in, in refactoring there. You just got to do it a little more manually. Um, OK, let us also handle this case. So here again, we can't listen for um, an all capital thing. We're never going to get a visit identifier. But we are going to get visit identifier expression. That's the thing we can listen for. Um, we didn't listen to our constant expression. We tried that thing I said I hadn't tried before, where instead we listened to the constant directly. We can't take this out, though. Um, you have to name all the things. If you name any one of them, you have to name all of them. Uh, must label all alternatives or none. <laughs> so even though we're not using it, we're naming it constant expression. But we are going to use this one. We're going to use identifier. And we'll use probably most of these other ones. Um, in fact, I think all of them. Maybe not function call. Um, so yes, let us uh, do identifier expression. Next, that would be to pull a variable value back out. So in our case, we want to pull this i to assign to j. Um, we also want to add, but we'll get there. So override visit, what was it? Identifier expression. And this should be pretty easy. And I wonder if Copilot will tell us something. So pull the var name, similar as we did before. Uh, if our variables dictionary doesn't contain it, throw an exception, return the variable. Sounds good to me. So yeah, this is great. We'll have a runtime error <laughs> if you try to use an undefined variable. Um, by the way, something that hasn't happened in our grammar is um, 
And I don't know if that would be something you do in grammar or somewhere else, but um, you don't have to define a variable first, right? So you can, there, there, isn't, there isn't this, this sense of, and this is very, again, JavaScript or PHP, very uh, interpreted language E, where you don't have to define a variable before you use it. What a nightmare. Uh, in some cases, because you can have a, you could type a, a variable name, right, and not realize that you just had one letter off, or typed too quick and got a couple letters swapped, or you know whatever. Um, a moment of dyslexia overcame you, um, and you got your your variable name wrong. Yeah, too bad you're gonna have weird behavior at runtime and not realize the problem until you finally see that silly little typo that you just missed 20 times. <laughs> so that's unfortunate. Um, there may be. I think the way to fix that would be. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't think you would do that in the error handler. I don't know. You'll have to solve that problem yourself. I haven't uh, tried to solve that yet. So anyway, that's a, a property of our language right now. Um, okay, but you certainly can't ask for the value of a variable before it's defined. You could. You could say, you know what? I want to return null for undefined variables. I think that's asking for even more trouble. <laughs> so let's let's. We can at least prevent that. We can at least at runtime say, whoa, don't call variables that don't exist, or don't ask for the values of variables that have not been defined. Um, so cool. That's done. Um, and I wonder if this is where you get into funny things like in JavaScript, you can delete a variable, which is a funny feature. Uh, let's not, I'm not even going to add that. Okay, so this will pull out a value. I'm fairly convinced this is going to work without testing it. Let's just assume that it is. Uh, let's implement the addition if we want, um, right, we want to do i plus 1. So we're hoping that j ends up with a value of 2. In order to get there, we're going to have to implement an addition operator. So this is another fun case where we have uh, right a few things going on. We're going to have an add operator. We're going to need to know if it's a plus or a minus. And why did I, okay? And here's another thing. Why did I do that instead of doing um, plus and minus? Because I could have done it this way as well. And this would, in some ways, be a little easier. And you could do it this way in your language if you wanted. And the reason, um, I guess, this would be called subtractive is again to do with the order of operations. Um, humans expect, I don't think, it could, it could be an issue if you have unsigned variables. So humans expect <laughs> that when you have an expression like three, four plus two minus one plus one, let's say, times two, yes, this happens first to be a two, but this all happens going left to right. And we expect that to be true as humans. In our language, I don't think it would matter. If we did these, if we put, you know, if we said we're going to do pluses first, so we happen to do 3, and we did 6, and we did 6 minus 3, that's fine. That's equivalent to doing 6. Um, ooh, actually, wait, it's not. 6 minus 1? Ah, oh, see, I'm a terrible liar. This is why it matters. 6 minus 1, that would be 5, plus 2, that'd be 7. Yeah, we're not expecting that result at all. Okay, so never mind. It's super important. <laughs> So yeah, so we have to do these from left to right. We can't have it be an ordered thing like this. Um, why did I think that was going to work out a different way? I started, I was talking with such confidence. Did you hear that? And then I was absolutely wrong. So <laughs> we need, we want them to happen left to right. Um, and I was saying for unsigned variables, you would certainly want them um, because you might not want to go negative. You might be assuming that the pluses are, you know, from left to right. But no, yeah, we have a real legit problem if we if we process all of our pluses before our minuses. So yeah, um, never mind everything I said. I was lying. I was wrong. You were laughing at me that whole time, and you were right to do so. Um, well, I mean, laughing was maybe a little rude. You could have been a little more polite, and, you know, pointed out the error uh, in, in a friendly way. But but anyway, <laughs> so we want them to happen at the same time or in reading order is, is how they're going to happen. Um, so we group them up our adds. Um, same with our multiplies. We're going to multiply, divide, and do modulus. Do we want to do modulus? I don't know. Let's just remove that, um, I don't know, for time. Uh, okay. And actually, I'm, I might just not implement all these for the sake of time and kind of leave doing all of it up to you. Um, but let's do addition for sure. Um, so we're going to visit. Let's go ahead and throw that down here. Override visit and additive expression. Sounds good. So what are the parts? we have the expression. So here, because we have two expressions, we get an array. Um, so let's go back and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So we've said, here's an additive expression. It's expression, add up expression. Ah, two expressions. Well, how do you differentiate? You just throw them in an array. So if I had said, for whatever reason, that my rule was expression, add expression, expression, 
that would make no sense in this example. We have an array with three things. Um, and when it turns your grammar into code, it is you know, smart and says, okay, in this case, then expression needs to be an array. Whereas in this case, we haven't done the parenthesized expression yet, but uh, when we visit a parenthesized expression, expression won't be an array. It'll just be a single result because again, it knows when, when it has turned your, um, your grammar into code. Um, so we're gonna have a left, uh, which would be the first expression. And I wonder if, yep, cool. Right, yep, cool. And here's something else. So it says, if the op type equals simple parser add. Okay, so it's kind of doing something, but that's not really what I wanna do. Um, I'm gonna get the operator as, uh, so I think it was like add op. Yeah, um, and let's get the text. And then we need to, depending on what the operator is, let's do this. So if it was a plus, then we need to add. But I wanna be able to handle different types. Uh, we can add strings together to concatenate them, or we can add integers, we can presumably add floats, right? We can add all these different things. And I don't think that this logic's gonna work. What is it, what would this do? Converting null little, yeah. I don't know, it doesn't like it. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna make a function, I'm just gonna call it add, and I'm gonna give a left and a right, right? And these are both nullable objects, again. We visited an expression, we don't know what we got back. We got back a nullable object, so we're gonna to have to handle that. Um, the other thing we would do is a minus, and I'll just go ahead and call that subtract. Why not? Let's look the thing, and then what's gonna throw? Yeah, sounds great. Not implemented. All right, now we need an add function, and I wonder, ooh, fun, it wants to do the multiplicative. Is that what it called it? That's really fun. Yeah, it's gonna write so much for us. Okay, but let's not do that right now. I'm gonna leave that for you guys to do. If you want to, you know, make your own language, but let's do this add function. Um, so that's sorry, that's not override. That's just going to be public object nullable again. We want to add a left and a right. Ooh, so this looks really good. Okay, so if the left is an int and the right is an int, then we sum the two up. If it's a float and a float, we sum the two up. Okay, there's another case I would like to handle though. Um, if the left is an int, yeah. Okay, we'll call it l int, and the right is a float. Yep, and then can you guess the other thing? If the right is a float, yep, we wanna add those. Return float plus int. Okay, and then what's the other example? We also wanna be able to add strings. So what if the left is a string? I think, whoops. Yeah, I think what I can do, I think I can just get away with doing left, right, right? And then we can do the same if right is a string, right? If either one is a string, we can just do some silly string concatenation. In fact, can we say if left is string or right is string? Can we just do that? Yeah, I think that'll work. Um, and then if you've added any two other things, I think in your code, I don't, I don't think this is not implemented. I think this is, you have made an error as a programmer when you wrote your script. So let's throw you a more different type of exception. Let's just say uh, exception, cannot add these values. Yeah, cannot add, sure. I mean, it would be nice to report on the types that we thought they are or something, right? Cannot add, sure, let's do that. Cannot add um, values of types uh, left to, or we want like left get type or something, right? Yeah, type and write get type. Oh, but it could be null. That's exciting. That's gonna look weird. Well, you get the idea. Well, you'll have to, I don't know. Um, can we do here? Will that work? Doesn't like that. Is that too much? Cannot be applied to operands of type and string. Hmm. Okay, well, if you want to make yours look prettier, you can do that. But I'm gonna, this is the gist of it, right? We want to let them know. It'll look a little funny. If they're null, I think it's gonna say like, suppose you did two nulls, I think it would say, cannot add values of types and, <laughs> right? With nothing in between. So that would look a little weird. Um, let's not worry about subtract for now and let's see if this has worked. So in theory, we now have visiting for additive expressions and handling those. We're gonna handle the plus operator. We're gonna add values. Um, we can add integers and floats and all those wonderful things. So far, we only have integers in our code, but we could um, we could do a float. Like, let's do let's do a float just to test it out. Um, so I think when we get to this assignment, we should have all those things.
let's see. And, and we're going to see, again, we'll see like I is 1, name is John whatever. All right, I, value 1, sounds great. Name, John, nickname, whatever, great. 2.2, a bunch of zeros and a 5 because floating point rounding. Don't worry about it. This is just how computers work. Your language is fine. Um, I don't know. This is one of those things that sometimes people believe. How come it's not accurate? It's like, because binary doesn't go to decimal as well as you'd like. Um, but okay, uh, J is 2.2. Yes, that is accurate. We have added 1.2 to 1. It looks like everything is working. Um, I mean, we can continue running. I don't think anything's going to happen. Oh, 5 to I? Ooh, so it's done something. Um, whoops, wrong thing. We haven't told it how to multiply yet. So it's just pulled out the four. I, I'm a little, it's a little interesting to me. I don't know. Again, I guess it's not just returning nulls under the hood. It must be saying, well, if I couldn't figure it out, at least I figured out this part. So I'll return that, right? This is again where I, I feel like it's behaving HTML. It's like, ah, I didn't know how to handle that part, but I understood the four. <laughs> um, and presumably the one, but not together. I don't know. Somehow or another got to five. Uh, our while loops aren't happening. Okay. Uh, let's do, again, I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to leave multiplication as an exercise for you guys. Um, let's do a while loop because I think the while and the else is the other interesting thing. Then we can write stuff out, like call a function. That would be super interesting. Um, and then I think yeah, we'll have like the basics. And again, you can fill in the rest of the blanks um, and the video will be over because, oh my goodness, if I click on this, how long have I been talking? An hour and 16 minutes? I mean, this could be a two hour video on how to make your own programming language. I mean, I don't know, maybe that's fair. It's hard work. <laughs> the first time I did this, it, I, I thought, oh, I can do this. I can knock this out in one video. And it took me five. And each one was between like half an hour and an hour. Um, so, but I implemented everything and I'm not going to bother to implement everything. Compare operators, right? You can imagine, same thing. You're going to return Booleans instead. Um, you might imagine now how you can pull out the bool op and see if it's and or. Do you want to support XOR? I don't know. Would you rather do the more classic, you know, this style? Again, you can do whatever you want. You're making your own programming language, but I'll leave that to you. But I at least really ought to show you loops and else's and function calls. So. Let's do that. We have a while loop in our script. We would love this to keep going while i is less than 8. Also, we don't have comments in our uh, language. You'll have to do that on your own as well. Okay, let's do a while loop. So when we visit a while loop, what do we want to do? Let's go to the bottom here. Override. Visit a while block. All right. While block has got some parts. I don't remember them all off the top of my head, so let's take another look. We have the while statement, which could be a while, and it could be an until. Um, oh, so we are actually going to need to do some uh, Boolean stuff after all, because we need while i is less than 8, right? Okay, so we're going to have to do that. Um, but let's do the while, which, sorry, I'm clicking all over again. So we have while, we have an expression, we have a block, and we have an else of block. So these are the four parts we, we need to think about. So let's get the expression first. So let's get the, well, let's not. Let's, let's get the while part first. So... Well, we want to inverse the logic if it's while versus until. Um, I think what that means I want to do, I'm going to make a function. I'm going to, I'm thinking ahead a little bit. So let me just do this and explain. Actually, I'm, I'm going to pause for the sake of time. And then I'll explain what I've done afterwards. So BRB. All right, here's what I've got. I want to be a little bit clever. I don't want to have to have an if block that says, if you did while, then I'm going to do this stuff with until, and then do the else. Else, I want to do, you know, the opposite logic. It's like, blah, 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 blah. let's just figure out, is this a while or not? Do we need to inverse the logic or not? And I'll have, I've, I've got some functions, is true, is false. We're going to want these anyway when we get to doing some Boolean stuff. This will be useful in other contexts. But I'm going to store this condition that will apply so that, we can just do a easy, oh my god, and look, it even wants to do this for us. Oh my god. Yeah, so this is the idea. We're going to call the condition. We're going to visit the expression. The expression is going to give us either a true or a false, or at least it hit better. Um, and while it is doing that, we're going to visit the context block, which 
again, is going to say, OK, visitor, go inside the block and figure out what it does. And so in this way, we'll execute that. We'll keep revisiting the same block over and over and over again. Sorry, I'm pointing. I'm touching my finger against the monitor, which is completely useless to you. <laughs> We're going to keep doing this, this block over and over and over again while this condition is true. And in order to support until, we just have to invert it, <laughs> right? So we just say is, is false as a condition. So we'll just wrap our little check here. Um, and we're going to say not Boolean. This is, again, where you could make a choice. Maybe you would say, you know what, if value is an int, well, you know, if i isn't 0, then that's true. You could do that in your language. You can do, you can do whatever you want. You could do the same for strings. A non-empty string you could say is true. I would recall or recall rename this is truthy maybe instead of is true but whatever um, and this is also where having value objects would help you because on your you know as i was giving this example we might have some sort of custom value object instead of an object question mark you might just have on that value object is truthy as a as a value you could just call at any point um, we're kind of throwing it in here because we don't have that custom value type so anyway this is great we're going to do that but i do want to do a little something else um, i want to say uh, if this is true, I guess I'll, it's a little gross. Um, oh, yeah, we can do, we can do this. Do a while. All right. Else, we would do the else block if we have it, which isn't what, right? We have an else if block. Yeah. All right. Right. Okay. So let's again summarize what this is. Also, is this too many parentheses? It looks like too many parentheses. Okay. Again, we want to have this neato syntax, <laughs> if you think it's neat, where if this was never true in the first place, if this condition was never met from the very get-go, we're going to do this else block. I've decided I want to add this wacky thing to my language. Um, judge me how you will. Uh, <laughs> so if the thing is true, we're going to do our little loop. As long as it's true, we're going to keep doing our loop. If it was never true, then we're going to do the else block, which, again, um, if we look at our grammar, this else if block, it could be just a straight up block, or it could be a whole other if block. So it could be else with followed by an if, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I think that's going to do it. We will support while or until using that. And we visited something, so we have to return something. Um, and you know, you could, I don't know, you could imagine a language in which you could write like j equals while. Right? Does this return something? Every everything that we visit can return something. I think that way madness lies. Um, so I'm not going to do it, and I'm just returning null here. Also, you would have to support that in your grammar, right? You would have to say that you know this could be an expression or a while block or something, right? You could do all those weird things. Um, I'm not going to do it. So anyway, decision that I have made. You can make your own decisions. Um, now we have visited while blooks, <laughs> blooks while blocks. <laughs> The problem is um, we have to support this bool operator. Um, and again, the order of operations here I talked a little bit about, um, you know, think about what these these look like. One plus two um, is less than three or, um, you know, true, let's say. You really want the Boolean to apply last. You want the compare to apply second last because you're going to evaluate this as one thing, right? I mean, think about how, how right, you, you're not expecting it to do this. <laughs> you don't think one plus the result of two less than three. So this is where this order is really important. You got to do this order right. Um, but anyway, let's do, this is not a bool operator. I'm not going to demonstrate any of those. You can code those yourself, but I'm going to do the compare operator um, in order to make our little script work. So let's override a compare operator, compare expression, um, because again, we called it compare expression. And I think GitHub Copilot's probably going to be pretty good at this. Left, right, I think we called it something else like compare op. And that looks like the same set to me. We can't use this. Now, you might say, huh, that's interesting. The equals is already defined. Did Ben do that while well, he paused in secret? No, this is the built-in C sharp equal that all objects have, and we don't want that. That would get us in trouble. Um, so we will call our own is equals. But actually, I'm not going to do that. Sorry. Um, I'm going to only do the less than right now. Uh, so this would be uh, private bool less than 
we'll have left and we'll have object right. And again, you'll have to implement the rest of them yourself, but I believe in you. And this is fascinating. Let's see what GitHub Copilot got for us. Left, float, float, float. And I'm gonna say you can't compare strings or booleans. Like I guess you could say false is less than true. If you wanna do that, you can make that decision. Um, I'm not gonna do that in this language. Um, thank you once again, GitHub Copilot, for making me a programmer that might be valuable even when GitHub Copilot is taking over the world. Let's debug this code and see if our while loop gets hit. Um, that's actually gonna be interesting, I think what we can do instead, let's move this down here. And we can add a breakpoint and see that j equals i, and we'll see what the value of i is. So we would expect, if this while loop is hit multiple times, it's gonna start as one. Is one less than eight? Sure is. Okay, i equals i plus four, so now it's gonna be five. Still less than eight, plus four is nine. Nine is not less than eight, so we ought to see j equals nine if we add a breakpoint here. And that'll tell us that our while loop is using. The other thing that would tell us is if we had that write function working. So that's definitely gonna be the next thing. And then I think this video is over. Um, so name, i equals five, i equals nine. That's another thing that tells us it's working. j equals nine. All right, sorry, and I was, I was looking down here with my eyes. Uh, you could have been looking here because that's what we were looking before. Um, yeah, so that appears to be working. It did the while loop a couple times. We got to the j. Um, you might think it a little interesting that we've never seen these um, expressions, but again, we've only been listening to, to assignments, right? Um, these are in theory happening behind the scenes, we just haven't been seeing the results. Um, we could assign a variable, we could say, um, let's try it out. Let's do, let's see that strings get properly added. I'm pretty sure they are. Let's, let's see, oops, I pressed plus not debug, or play not debug. All right, debug. Do, 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 do. So we have John in quotes one, whatever. Great. So our string concatenation is working too. Let's make a function call. So here's how I decide to do function calls. There's a lot of ways that you could do this. I would like in the future for my scripting language to be able to create functions. And functions, um, you know, another feature of a lot of languages is that you can assign a function to a variable. So I would like for you to be able to assign functions to variables. I haven't quite decided on what the syntax would be. Maybe that would be like, you know, my func equals, and then maybe some sort of at sign or something to distinguish. Um, I think I might need that. Um, let's say that we just called write a. I, I think I might need some sort of symbol or something out here because otherwise this might be interpreted as a parenthetical, parenthetical um, expression, right? Like how would I do this in the grammar exactly? Um, you know, or maybe it would be good enough to say, uh, you know, some list of, you know, I don't know, uh, some list of variables and then a block at the end, you know, whatever. Uh, there's going to be something there. I don't know. It might help to have a special very uh, special symbol in front to make that easier. I don't know. So I was thinking maybe an at because at has to do with places, I don't know, whatever, you can come up with anything, or maybe I don't even need it, maybe this would be good enough, or maybe you do the C-sharp style where you do the little arrow, whatever you want. So I was thinking of doing something like that, right, of this concept of we're going to assign functions uh, to variables. So along those lines, this function right um, should probably just be a variable that already exists. Um, so let's do something wacky like that. Uh, let's make a constructor <laughs> called simple visitor. And when you start up your application, I'm going to make a variable called, it's interesting, it says, oh, maybe, yeah, you could do this. Maybe pi is a predefined variable in your language. Um, again, it's a little scary because you could redefine these things, right? At runtime, you could just say pi equals two. If you had custom value types, you could say, no, I made this value type, give it a constant thing, blah, 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 right? You could do that kind of thing and not let people rewrite them. Um, our language doesn't have that feature, so that's a problem. Uh, I don't know, I guess I'll leave those in. Um, but let's also make a variable called write. But this is gonna equal a function. Um, so I'm gonna make a function, and I always get these confused. I think the return, you know, the parameters are first, and then the, I always forget. Um, 
and I'll call this right. So let's let's see. Delegate name not valid. Oh, gotta do new. Okay, so what is this? When I hover over, tell me. Uh, result. Okay, yep. The, so the result of everything should always be object question mark, right? That's our thing. And then for a list of parameters, it's some array of nullable objects. So let's make now a private object right that takes um, some args. Sounds good to me. And uh, yeah, I guess that gave me something that looked kind of reasonable for each. Weird. Um, for each. I'm really wanting GitHub Copilot. Arg and args, console right. Okay, that sounds great. So if you pass it a list of things, it's going to go through all of them and dump them on the console. And this function returns nothing. It returns null. Um, okay, sounds good. So, But now we need this to get called somehow, right, invoked. All we've done right now is made a variable called write that, again, someone could <laughs> replace. <laughs> a little dangerous. Um, but we need to, if we go back to our grammar, hit the function call, uh, function call expression. But we also just have general function calls, right? And this is another case where we can say, uh, when you visit a function call, I think that'll be fine. Ooh, I'm a little, I'm a little worried actually. I don't know if that will count for the expression. We'll find out. Um, let's do function call because we—that's the case we're, we've gotten now, right? You're, we're going to say function call, write, and then pass in something. In our case, we're passing in strings, integers, whatever. It won't matter. We're going to use the built-in console uh, write line or console. Yeah, actually, yeah. Let's do write line, not write. Okay, so we need to visit, I'll throw it up here, why not? Um, visit a function call. What are we going to do? I'm really curious to see. So name equals identifier get text. Yes, but it does need to be identifier. Probably would have known that if I'd put it after <laughs> or I had done things. And then it says, what does it say? It says, go through the list of expressions. So that would be all these, right? In this array, we don't know how big it is. It could be of any length, zero or none, or sorry, <laughs> zero or infinite. Um, and it says visit each of these expressions, right? And that makes sense. We've seen that before. We want to visit an expression to get the value out. Um, I think the IDE is suggesting that we can just say select visit. Then we're going to turn that into an array. That does make sense. Um, then we say, do we have a thing in here, out value. That works for me. I think uh, that looks a little weird to me for some reason. Um, I'm just gonna say if not variable uh, contains key uh, name, then we'll throw that exception. Otherwise, we're going to get the function out and it might not be a function, this is the thing. Yeah, I really don't want to do this cast that it's suggesting. I would like to type check it and say, is it one of those? Um, so actually, I think we can, we can just do that here. We can say, if this is, then that's our function. Yeah, and then we can return function args. Uh, if it isn't, then this is a little backwards now. I don't like it, um, so I'm not going to do it that way. Let's do not. I'm going to wrap this Let's be a little consistent here. Um, we're going to throw new exception, not function. Great. New account on your copilot. <laughs> and I'm going to be silly and not have curly braces. Even though my language, by the way, I don't know if you noticed, I, I like not having curly braces for these one line things, but this language actually requires them for blocks, right? Which is whatever. Make it that way you will. Um, so if it wasn't a function, using a gated pattern. Sure. All right. If it's not a function, say it's not a function. But if we've made it this far, great, we can call the function. Love it. And I, this is, I don't know, I like having kind of all the precondition checks up top so you don't have any block for, because the other way to do this would be like, if it contains the key, open block. If the thing is a function, open block. And then you have like, you know, two levels of curly braces before you call the function. And then you have else's where you're throwing exceptions and they're all over the place. They look very disconnected from their source. I don't know if it's making sense. I could write it out. But anyway, I like having the preconditions one at a time up top. If we don't have this, this is what you do. If you don't have this, this is what you do. We made it? Okay, do the thing. And that makes a lot of sense to me. So I'm just going to press play now, and we should see output for our function. i isn't big enough. 
1. So let's make it bigger. i isn't big enough. 5. So let's make it bigger. i is 9. Let's look at our program. Guys, I think we did it. Um, I think that's it. I think, that, right? We, we did it. We fucking did it. Look, it ran. The, we've made a programming language. This was the whole point. Um, in theory, until, or what was it? Yeah, until i is less than 9. So let's say until i is greater than 10. Let's try that and see if that works. Uh-oh, we got an error. Playing with antler has stopped working. <laughs> uh, we're going to debug that. The method or operation is not implemented. Oh, I didn't implement the greater than symbol. Um, so that's not working. Uh, do, 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 do. We'd have to do a greater than. Ugh. All right, I'm going to do it. I don't know. Uh, just to prove that maybe that also works. Uh, greater than. All right, help me out, Copilot. I believe in you. I'm just going to assume that that works. Dangerous. I isn't big enough, not big enough, not big enough. So our while loop works, our until loop works. Uh, we can probably just do a thing. If uh, I is less than 10, we'll just... Oh, and I don't have to do this. It should work, except I haven't implemented the parenthetical uh, expressions. Uh, but this should work too. It's not going to, it's not a while loop, so it only does it once. Yep, so we got our if checks. You could also consider doing unless if you wanted to implement that. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to stop the video here. I mean, this is, this is the thing. Again, what would you do with this? I don't know. Um, scripting language for your own game if you didn't want to, you know, there, there's other ways to accomplish that goal if that's what you want. Um, you can get things that will let you interop between Python and, and C Sharp. We can call some Python from C Sharp and get the results and, and pass things into it, right? There's things that do that. Um, the thing that I think is extra cool about this, um, which you could also do with, with those like language interop things, but here is you could imagine making functions that are super specific to your game, like like, like for um, Poppy Seed Pets, which is a browser-based game. I have a MySQL database on the back end. Maybe I would want to, you know, update player gold or money, you know, and say, give them I money. Um, and then behind the scenes, this doesn't do a simple console write line. It does, you know, get the database through, you know, dependency injection, blah, 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 right? You could, you know, find the current user, find their money, increment it, you know, whatever, add player money. So you, you could do whatever you wanted. It could be super specific to your, to your application to interact with it. Um, however you want, and I think that's super cool. Uh, the danger is, of course, with this much power comes uh, responsibility. You could, um, you know, accidentally write a while loop that uh, never finishes or something. You know, you say while it's less than 10 and then you do a little mistake here, and now you have an infinite loop somewhere <laughs> in your funny script, so. Uh, but I don't know, you know, this doesn't turn anyone off, I don't think, the, you know, you like the power overall. Um, of course, it's going to come with drawbacks. Um, so anyway, uh, that's it. I hope this was fun. Again, I don't know. This is something I've been wanting to do, I think, literally for like 20 years because that's how old I am. That's how long it was when I was in college. Um, I guess I haven't been wanting to do this ever since I finished that class, but it's something I've thought about. It's like, oh yeah, that was really cool making my own programming language. How do I do that? I forgot. I don't remember how to use the tools, right? Um, in that cl class, we made a compiler it went to a fake assembly. The, I, I don't remember if I mentioned this at the beginning of the video. doesn't matter. Um, for my purposes, this has satisfied what I wanted. <laughs> I have accomplished the goal that, that I had. Um, and hopefully, this is something that's useful to you and you can find a, a neat use for, or maybe it's just fun. There's nothing wrong with it being utterly useless and you just having some fun adding features that you were like, man, why doesn't my favorite programming language have this funky feature, and else after my while loop. <laughs> you know, whatever you want to do. Have fun with it. Um, thank you very much for watching. This is a very long video. Don't know when I'll post again, but again, thank you for watching. This stuff is fun to make, so um, if you made it this far, I'm glad that I uh, also entertained you. <laughs> Goodbye.